Is this a bad time to say that I don't actually really like the R8? What do you mean, yes? Hello everybody, it's another very hard day at the office for the JM on Cars team. We're again back at Milton Keynes with some more lovely Audis. And today we're working with something a little bit more modern. You see, I've recently spent a week in the brand new R8 V10 Performance. A car which I eventually enjoyed, but it has to be said, didn't really ever work its way under my skin. And so, in an effort to sway me, the people here have been very kind and have decided to try and tempt me with this pair of extremely rare first-generation cars. Now, first things first, I have to be totally honest. I have always said that I much prefer the look of the newer car over the older ones. This is kind of making me change my mind. This R8 LMX is stunning properly properly amazing and it's paired here with this also relatively striking but to my eye not quite as pretty r8 gt spider now for those of you who are unaware what makes each of these cars quite so special i will do a brief run through and walk around and then we will of course take them out on the road to see how they fare now the r8 gt is the first kind of proper limited edition r8 that audi did that was serious in nature they have done limited editions of various different types in various different markets but this one was a fairly comprehensive effort the main feature of the gt which sets it apart from the other models is their attention to weight saving the r8 has never been a particularly lightweight car or even with its aluminium space frame chassis but this one is by r8 standards now this unfortunately is the convertible. Uh, Audi do have a coupe and if you're into buying one of these kind of things then Audi, speak to them, their coupe is up for sale with very low miles and an excellent history. But this is what we've got to play with today. Now this car, if the facts and figures are to be believed, is a hundred kilos lighter than a regular R8 V10 Spider. So what are a few of the things that set it apart? Well. Mr. Darren, come with me and I'll walk you around. Now, the first thing you may notice at the front is a slightly sharper treatment thanks to these carbon fiber canards, and this carbon fiber splitter down the front. These lightweight wheels are exclusive to the GT and they're this kind of tridenty looking thing going on. I'm not actually a big fan of them myself. Maybe one of the most amazing things on the car is the fact that the whole windscreen surround is now carbon fiber, as are the wing mirrors. This car also has a fixed lightweight carbon rear spoiler and it's got a carbon fiber diffuser down here sat between these two very chunky exhausts. Now, perhaps I've just never really paid attention before, but I really do like the design of these rear lights. They look nice and sexy and modern. They are, however, not the most current design, even by first gen R8 standards. Uh, the ones on the LMX are a totally different style and they introduced that silly kind of pulsating indicator thing that Audi sort of started off and I, I hate that. Sorry, it's just pet peeve of mine. Um, however, I'm really not fond of this big plastic kind of painted gray looking thing at the back. It, with all the real carbon fiber that's on this car, this, that is a little bit of a shame. Uh, I am also told by my keen cameraman and Audi fan Darren that this is the debut of the circular exhaust on the R8. Although if you, you look inside, you can see that this is just a sort of covering and there are separate pipes in there. Uh, the GT also has this little vent here, which does appear to be functional. Little things for you. Now you've also got carbon vents here. But the inside is pretty special because you have these fixed ultra lightweight carbon fiber bucket seats and they are pretty figure hugging. There is Alcantara everywhere along with this weird material that appeared in the new R8 and I call back of gardening glove. It's a strange thing, don't like it at all. The steering wheel is basically the same as all the other R8s and there's loads of other carbon on the interior of these things. Now, one of the reasons that I've criticised the first generation R8 in the past is the fact that the interior is, for my mind, 
just a little bit too Audi, it's just normal regular Audi. However, in these limited cars with all the things that get thrown at them, they do feel a little bit more special. My favorite bit of the GT being these white with red dials. I mean, white dials are just cool, fact. Now this car is one of 333 ever made. More accurately, it is number 92 of 333 ever made, as evidenced by the number scribed onto the gear stick. Now that gear stick is connected to an R-Tronic gearbox. That was Audi's single clutch automated manual effort from about 10 years ago. At the time when the R8 came out, Audi didn't offer a dual clutch because they said that there wasn't a dual clutch solution that would fit in the car. And with the numbers of these that they sold, they were not sure that it was gonna be worth developing one. The engine in this produces 560 horsepower, which is a little bit more than the old V10 plus and quite a bit more than the regular V10. It's more still than the current V10 base. So actually it's about the same because the V10 base has just been upgraded from 540 to 570. Uh, the V10 performance now produces about 620, but this car is not actually part of our test today. It's just sort of been carelessly left here in the Audi car park. Now, later on, Audi introduced the LMX. This was a run out special. The R8 was basically done by the time this was released. You could see it as the sort of second incarnation of the GT, but the truth of the matter is it's actually a fairly different car. Their attitude to weight saving was nowhere near as aggressive in this car, and as a result, this one weighs basically the same as that, even though that one is a convertible. This one has 570 horsepower from its 5.2 litre V10. It still oodles of carbon fibre, including this big massive side blade here and one thing i noticed today which is rather unfortunate is the fact that the top of the side blades on the original car are also useless they, they do nothing on both sides this one's got the fuel filler flaps obviously that does something but the other side does nothing however stylistically it looks pretty mega now if you come around to the front you'll see the part of the lmx which is what's supposed to make it most special that is the one part of the car we're not going to be able to test today you see the ra lmx was supposed to be a world debut of laser headlight technology uh, sadly bmw actually beat audi to the punch they built a whole bunch of i8s uh, about a week before this came out, and so BMW kind of snatched that away from Audi, which I think is very, very unsportsmanlike of BMW. However, one of my criticisms of the new R8 is the way that the interior is. This thing fixes that. So let's get that horrible lorry out of the background of the shot, because I can see Darren's face. I can see his face from here. He's looking at that and going, Arr! But we've got a job to do, and we're going to be professionals about this. So, Darren, you come around this side, stick your head in, I'll go around the other side, and I'm sure nobody at home will have even noticed that that happened. So, you pop your bonts in there, and you'll be greeted with an interior that I think really does feel a step above. Now, that thing over there, there are 333 of. Well, that's a common car for common people this one's a proper one there's only 99 of these of which this is number 23. this has the wing back seats not quite as aggressive as the fixed buckets in those and the backs of them are painted this is something that i actually mentioned in my review of the new r8 if they painted the backs and put some color coded stitching in the car it would just liven up the interior and that's what it does you've even got the color coded stitched alcantara headlining which looks absolutely amazing both cars curiously have the same setup of gear lever, despite the fact that they have different gearbox technologies in them. What's kind of unfortunate is the fact that this is really nice to use. That is a nice action, but the gear shift in my mind is the wrong way around. That should be up, that should be down in this. It's not bad Audi, that, that is wrong. Um, however, oodles of carbon fiber in here, slightly more up-to-date nav system and shamefully just black on red dials or red on black dials steering wheel again standard paddles also like the newer car just a touch disappointing but these two cars are going to be all about the drive you see it's been an awfully long time since i've driven a first generation car and if any first gen r8 is going to be able to actually impress me it's going to be one of these two Ah! 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 It's coming in over me! Ah! Ah! Oh, 
this is a terrible plan. <laughs> so we're out on the road and the weather simply cannot decide what it wants to do. It has just rained on me, as you may or may not have noticed. Now, initial impressions of the R8 GT are very mixed indeed. At low speeds, when it's cold around a car park, it is absolutely horrible. It, it's awful. I mean, the car was trying to lurch around the place and it, it felt pretty wrong, to be fair. However, the moment the car warms up and you start to stretch its legs, oh, it becomes something quite brilliant. gearbox is certainly not perfect and around town it's probably at its worst. That being said, it is at least fairly smooth. It's definitely better for example than Aston's Speed Shift 2. The car with a similar gearbox that I've driven most recently would be the V10 M5 and I have to say that this is better than that. When you're moving around town they're both pretty similar, both fairly smooth, more so than you would expect but they certainly won't be rushed. However, when you're pressing on this one is very good indeed. It's got a sport mode, and to be honest, yeah, may as well press that, because it's not seamless in either mode, but in sport mode, it is certainly a lot faster. Now, when you're over yeah, about 4,000 RPM, it seems, downshifts in this thing are utterly delicious those are really good i'll see if i can give you a sample so i'm going to shift up and now yeah very happy to deliver yes there's a little delay but in fairness this isn't a million miles off say the first generation of pdk believe it or not porsche's double clutch box wasn't always the bastion of perfection that it is now what is utterly brilliant in this car is that engine and in the GT although we're in the Spider, this does not feel short of firepower whatsoever this thing really hustles sounds pretty good too it's not crazy silly bombastic loud like the first of the second generation R8s it's a well judged volume that isn't obscene at all but has a real good quality of sound. Oh yes, that is just mm, magic. You can feel this car's much firmer dampers. Now I don't know by exactly what margin they firm the settings up, but it's pretty noticeable. That all-wheel drive system also means that in these pretty mixed conditions you can be fairly confident about putting your foot down. Steering. Let's talk about that R8 Achilles heel, shall we? I think it is better than in the later cars, but not by the margin that it really should be. It's certainly direct enough and you've got much more texture than in the later cars, but it's just still quite some way short of the system you would get in a McLaren or a Ferrari. Now I've seen quite a few people try and make the claim that a single clutch gearbox gives a car more of a kind of analog edge. Very often I would tell you that what they're trying to give you is a pretty poor excuse for a car's character flaw. In this case however I think it may bear some fruit. Ah! Damp fruit! Oh this is... oh! Ah! Oh, ah! 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 Where did this rain come from? Ah, oh, Darren, this is a terrible idea. You're a rubbish meteorologist. Ah! You wanted to get the roof down. Yeah, you you agreed. Uh. You're a co-conspirator. Ah! Pull over. Pull over. Pull over. Right, pull over. grab that camera. How do I do that? No, 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 no. See the handle. See the handle. See the handle. Twist the handle, and then the whole thing's. Actually, no. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Oh. Uh. Is the camera right? Yeah. Oh. Shit. 
I suppose this is a finer point as any to mention the R8's off-sighted USP. Its place in the world as the everyday supercar, the all-weather, all-rounder. You see, I've never really subscribed to the idea that a 911 Turbo is a supercar, for various reasons I'm not going to get into. This, however, definitely is. One of the curious things about the R8 Spider 2 is the fact that with the roof up, it's actually remarkably well refined. There's an awful lot of convertibles I've driven, even stuff like the Boxster, where they're lovely and fun with the roof down, but then you put the roof up and they're basically just as loud and shouty as they always were. This one actually genuinely does feel like a coupe with it up. What's perhaps most impressive about the GT is the fact that although it is much lighter than the standard car, this doesn't feel like any stripped out track special. It's not noisy or shouty or windy or anything in here. It feels exactly like standard R8. It's got air conditioning, it's got a hi-fi, it's got all those lovely things that you would expect from your everyday supercar. It is a great shame that Audi never made these with the manual box because they would then be truly magnificent and a real antidote to what the regular RA is. You know, previously if you'd asked me, would I ever be interested in one of these, an Artronic gearboxed convertible RA, I would have said, absolutely no way in hell. You take your car and you shove it. But having experienced this car in a wide range of conditions in such a short period of time, well, its positives are beginning to shine through. Even with these awful roads, it can do some silly things and I can have a lot of fun with it. Miraculously, after driving a Jaguar XJ220 the other week, the Audi somehow doesn't even feel as wide as it used to. Funny that. My major criticism of this GT is in fact the interior. Not that it's a particularly bad place, but there's a very odd mix of materials with the leather, Alcantara, gardening glove and carbon fibre. And it just doesn't feel like quite as cohesive a place as the LMX. fun in the rain we decided to take an early lunch and let the weather blow over oh, which it did and now it's blown back so we're out in the LMX and it's raining again although currently only lightly now even at these modest speeds you can feel a huge difference between this and the GT it is massively more refined the gearbox is just whirring through the ratios with absolutely no effort whatsoever it's a seamless thing and the car is much softer it's still not a soft car overall it's still on the firm side of things there are as far as i can tell no adjustable dampers in this and maybe because this car is also a coupe it seems a little bit more refined the brakes in this do feel quite grabby too, which they do in the new car, but for whatever reason, they didn't seem to in the GT. Officially, this has got about 10 more horsepower. This was the most powerful of all of the old school R8s. In a moment, when it's warmed up, I will stretch its legs, but I'm keen to see if it can feel quite as visceral as that GT. Now these seats are beautiful. They are the wing backs, same as you would find in a B7 RS4 like the one Darren has and in many different cars of the period. Now they strike a brilliant blend between comfort and support and it's a tragedy that they are a very rarely specced option in an R8. And this car in particular demonstrates something that I've said so many times before. The R8 can be a brilliant place to be but the standard specification just lets it down. This car with its extended leather, its Alcantara stitch headline, color-coded stitching is just awesome and feels every bit of its very high original asking price. 
It's little details too, like the fact that Darren noticed the R8 and V10 logo on the rev counters are embossed. They stand out and they look fabulous. Even the boot has blue stitching in it. That is a nearly Italian level of attention to detail. The Bang & Olufsen stereo in here is also miles better than that in the new car. It really does put it to shame in many ways. As a cruising experience, this thing is wonderful. You could easily see yourself doing big miles in it, which is not something I'm convinced you could do in the GT. It would hinge very much on whether you got on with those bucket seats or not. There is far more adjustment in these seats too. You can have the back adjusted, you can even adjust the lateral support and the height. Uh, none of those things you can do in the GT. But let's find out whether it's still got some go in it, shall we? It moves, but it doesn't feel anywhere near as brutal as the GT. Let's drop down another cog. There we go. But it's lacking a bit of bite. It's a very, very curious sensation. So it's not a slow car. Far, far from it. But if you told me that the GT was packing another 50 horsepower on top of this, I would believe you. This one also seems to be struggling for traction, just a little bit more as well. It's certainly dealing with the lumps and bumps of this road in a far better and far more controlled fashion. In the GT you can feel every individual pebble, but this is kind of joining the dots, it's smoothing everything out a little bit. You still know that it's a bumpy road that you're on, but you're not quite as worried about it. The S-Tronic gearbox is indeed very good, but again, it just seems nearly a little detached after the GT. There's just something missing, and it's really killing me, it, it seriously is. That GT I've properly fallen for, it's a raucous, crazy kind of thing, most un audi like and the numbers would tell you that this car should sort of be that and a bit more, it's more power, it's kind of similar weight with the, the Spider slash Coupe comparison. But somehow it's just missing it. Perhaps the gear ratios are a bit different, but even that shouldn't make any sense because this has more gears. And the top speeds between the two are near enough the same, they're just shy of 200 mile an hour. I don't get it. I really don't get it. This example's got more miles on it as well, 6,500 versus 5,000 of the other one. But this isn't a slow car, not at all. Perhaps it is just that connection you have with the road, the car, the noise of the thing, all that. Maybe it just adds up, maybe it's a complete placebo effect. But we're driving supercars here, and supercars are all about the experience. And the fact of the matter is that the LMX just doesn't deliver that experience that the GT does. Just something missing, just something missing, and I'm not the only one. My co-pilot here agrees with me on it, but if I'm gonna see something in the LMX's favor, I mean, point one, this looks amazing. I mean, just on looks alone, I'd have one. It's awesome. In this color particularly, I might accept red, and that's about it. does have beautiful throttle response. I mean, in isolation, you would think nothing but good thoughts about this car. However, driving that GT just before has given me a perspective on this that you just otherwise would not have. And I suppose which car is best really comes down to what you intend to use it for. Do you want a supercar that you're really going to drive on a daily basis or do long distances in that kind of thing? In that case, the LMX is far superior. 
It also has the added bonus of being even rarer and therefore should hold its value just a little bit better. And as things go, it's always going to be a reasonably special car. However, if you want the classic supercar experience, but with that sort of modern edge that only an Audi will give you, I would say the GT every single time. And the gearbox isn't even the sort of killjoy that I thought it would be. Yes, it would be just infinitely better with a manual, but that Artronic really does add to the experience. It does genuinely add some drama to the package. This thing is just so well-rounded, it's perhaps a little too Audi. And I say that in hushed tones because it, it sounds like a swear word when I say it. And I know, I think, probably more than a lot of people, that Audi can make some properly exciting stuff. And in the GT, they did. I'd love to find a GT that's finished in the same way as this is because this really feels like the more special place if you're just sat in it you know you're not going anywhere it's it's miles better and if you're doing any sort of mileage in town this is a far more pleasant experience but when you see that sign which tells you to go for it I like this but it doesn't make me grin like an idiot So there we go everyone, the R8 GT versus LMX, a pair of rare cars indeed and I must say a result which really surprised me. Thank you all for watching, I hope you've enjoyed, please like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, we'll see you for the next one, bye bye. Quick, 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 quick. Ah. Ah, ah, oh that literally just started tipping it down. Just so I turned around in that uh oh, is it's not working. Huh? Oh, have you finished? No, no, because it hasn't done it. Oh, oh. Ah.